Hey everyone, welcome to our online service today. We're glad you're here joining us. We're gonna jump right back into the uh, book of Ephesians with Pastor Shane, so grab your Bibles, grab your coffee, and uh, I'll see you after the message. Welcome. We're so glad that you're joining us today as we continue in our study through the letter to the Church of Ephesus from Paul. Uh, we're going to be in Romans. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter five, verse one through twenty today. So I want to encourage you to just turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter five, verse one through twenty. You know, when I was younger, I idolized rock groups. Uh, I didn't just buy rock albums. I would buy the album and I would go through, read all the lyrics, read the liner notes. I uh, memorized who was in what bands, when they, who wrote what songs, when they formed, all those kinds of statistics about the bands. I read all sorts of rock magazines. I subscribed to three different rock magazines for years. <clears throat> I kind of inundated myself with the culture because I idolized these people. And as a result of that, I kind of started to try to imitate them in some ways, shapes and form, whether it be the way I looked, the way I dressed, even some of my attitudes, that kind of thing. You know, and that's a pretty common thing, especially for younger people to idolize famous people, whether it be sports figures or entertainers, or maybe even just the older kid down the street. And when we idolize someone, we tend to imitate them in different ways. Uh, one of the things that was popular when I was a kid was, was uh, Madonna and Boy George were two popular figures. And there would be girls that would literally dress in every way, shape, or form exactly like Madonna. Um, they call them Madonna bees. Um, or guys that dress like Boy George, and they would just kind of try to emulate him in the way he dressed. And that's kind of one of the problems with a lot of performers is they don't want to accept the responsibility that the fact is people, when people look up to someone, when they respect something about somebody, especially when they're younger, they're usually formed by them and there's a responsibility as role models. It's kind of part of the job because young people like to imitate what they like. Well, as when we become adults, we don't really have as much of a culture of imitation. In fact, we kind of pride ourselves, if you will, on being more individuals, right? We, the more individualized we can be, the better we feel about ourselves and our culture. But in previous cultures, imitation was encouraged, and it was something that was very much a part of being an adult. In fact, many people uh, would apprentice under someone or be the disciple under someone, and they would just not just seek to learn from them, but they would seek to learn everything about them and seek to emulate them and imitate them, oftentimes as much as possible. You wouldn't just study their trade or their teachings. You would study them. In fact, oftentimes you would live with them, Jesus and his disciples. His disciples lived with him for three years, um, and that forms who you are when you see how people interact with their friends, with their family, how, how they do every aspect of life together. It went much further than skills and it went into 
their character. You know, much of my ministry, I model after the first pastor I had the pleasure of serving under. He was the kind of person that I really looked up to. He was more than a boss to me, more than a pastor. He was my mentor. And much of what I do in ministry is kind of formed after him, both the good and the bad that comes with that. It's been said that imitation is the highest form of flattery. And, you know, as Christ followers, if we are as adults to imitate anyone, we should be seeking to imitate Christ. You know, in fact, you'll notice if you've been around MVF Church very long, I tend not to use the word Christian. I like to say Christ followers when I talk about us. Because in our culture, even though Christian means little Christ, a person that follows Christ, in our culture, we've kind of interpreted that word now to mean someone who holds to a certain set of beliefs, someone who would believe they hold to the right beliefs about Christ. But you see, Christ followers are really what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to not just believe the right things about Jesus. We are supposed to imitate him, emulate him, follow after him in everything that we do. There's a saying that I had on a sign when I was younger, and I'd kind of like to use that saying as a question for us to think about uh, this week. The saying was this, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convince you? Right? So if you were on trial for being a Christ follower, would there be enough evidence to convince you? Think about your life in that term. If someone were to put you on trial because of your faith, Would they even be able to bring enough evidence to show that you truly have faith in Jesus? Would they show that your life follows after him? So that said, let's go ahead and look at Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 1 through 20. It says this, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual morality and all impurity or covenants must not be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness or foolish talk or crude joking, which is out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. Let's stop there for a second. Let's look at what Paul says here. I want to focus primarily on verses 1 and 2 because this is the heart of what he's trying to get to in this part of the passage. He says, be imitators of God. And he even says, why? Why should we be imitators of God? Because we are his beloved children. And he kind of talks about what does it mean to imitate God? Well, to live as Christ lived, to love and give ourselves up for him. You see, in Greek culture, it was taught that there were three points to learning. The first point to learning was theory, and then there was imitation, and then there was practice. Well, Paul, throughout this letter, kind of gives us all three of these. The first three chapters we talked about, that's the theology, that's the theory, that's the why we want to do this, right? Then there's the imitation. Well, from four through this passage today, he's kind of talking about what it looks like to imitate Christ. And then, in starting next week, we're going to look at the practice. How does that play out in the various roles we live here on this earth? And so Paul's saying, this is the time where he's going to talk about, we need to be imitators. We need to imitate the one we're seeking to learn from. Why? Because we are beloved children. You know, when I, I, that terminology, beloved children, makes me think of my kids, especially when they were little. You know, when my kids were little, they they sought to do everything the way I and Tanya do things. Um, And especially David with me used to do everything the way I would do it, down to the point of, like, he wanted to dress like me. I, you know, dressed up for church, 
He wanted to dress up for church. He didn't want to wear his little kid clothes. He wanted to wear a button-up shirt and khakis and nice shoes, dressed the way dad dressed for church. Uh, I used to mow, when I mowed the lawn, he would follow behind me in his, with his little bubble lawnmower. He, he had a little tool bench to work out in the garage when dad worked out in the garage. He liked to do everything the way I did it. But then as he got older, he started to kind of develop his own style. And you kind of hope as an adult that his, his goal is not to imitate my actions per se, it's more to imitate the things in my heart that he sees that have value. The things that he sees in me that he wants to continue in his own life, he, to, to have those same attitudes of his heart, to, to live out his life the way I live out my life, but not necessarily imitating every action, right? And then obviously in the areas that I'm, I'm weak in, Hopefully, he desires to even grow past that and to better himself. Now, obviously, when it comes to imitating Jesus, Jesus is perfect, and there's nothing that we're going to find a weakness in that we're going to better ourselves in. But it made me think about when I was, growing, when I was early in my faith, the way I sought to imitate Christ was to focus on what I did, right? Well, I don't do this, and I do do that, and if I keep, kind of have these categories, maybe I'll be more like Jesus. But what I have found is the more I grow in my faith, the more I've learned being like Jesus, imitating Jesus has so much more to do with my heart. See, it says that he gave himself up. And perhaps the hardest thing about imitating Christ is the act of sacrificing ourselves for others. See, we, we spend most of our time in this life learning how to look out for ourselves, don't we? We're constantly learning to take care of ourselves, And so to learn to, take, to sacrifice for others is a huge, huge role in being an imitator of Christ. One of the heroes of my faith early on was uh, Mother Teresa. And in fact, I was kind of sad when Mother Teresa died because she died within days of Princess Diana. And I always felt like Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa accomplished so much more in her life than Princess Diana. And I'm not saying Princess Diana wasn't a good person and didn't uh, contribute, but Mother Teresa's death and her life were overshadowed in the memory at that time because everyone focused on Princess Diana. And I always kind of thought that was sad. But I, when you think about why was Mother Teresa such a, an important figure of the 20th century, it was simply because Mother Teresa spent her life sacrificing for others. She gave herself up for other people. That's all she did, but she did it every single day. See, in Paul saying here, of all the things you do, the key is to practice a life of giving ourselves up for Jesus and God every day to give ourselves up for God and others every single day. You know, as I was studying this passage, when you look at this list in verses 3 through 8, you see a lot of different sins. But you know, the more you think about all those sins, every one of those sins is simply a different expression of selfish ambition. Every sin is just another way that we express express our selfish ambition, right? Why do we lie? We lie so that we can look better in front of other people. We lie so that we can get out of trouble. We lie so that we can gain, somehow think some, it's going to help us gain some sort of popularity or, or whatever with other people. It's about selfish ambition. Why do people steal? They steal so that they can get something for themselves, selfish ambition. Why do we struggle with pride? Because we want to look better than other people. We struggle with jealousy because we're always worried about what, what we deserve versus what other people deserve. It's selfish ambition. Even sexual sins that Paul talks about here. The satisfying ourselves in, in a sexual way, in a sinfully sexual way, is, is just a simple way of gratifying our, our selfish nature and not, being, not in a loving nature in which God intended. We are called to imitate Christ. And to imitate Christ is to give ourselves up for him every day and to sacrifice ourselves for others and for God. Well, he continues in verse 8. 
He says, for a one time you were in darkness, but now you are in the light of the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the fruit, unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. You know, I look at that. I think, in a sense, what Paul's saying here is represent Christ. Imitate Christ, but represent Christ. And possibly that's why we're called to imitate Christ, right? He says, walk as children of the light. Don't take part in the things that, that, that are out of the light, that take part of the darkness, the evil of this world. Learn and discern what is pleasing to the Lord. And notice, once again, he makes a reference to children, to walk in the light as children of God. See, children in that culture had a responsibility to live up to the name of the family, to carry the name of the family. In fact, their inheritance depended on it, and a father could disown a child if they didn't live up to the name, if they felt like they shamed the family name. <clears throat> in verse 8 to through 14, we see Paul contrast this between light and darkness. And it's meant to be a stark contrast. It's meant to point out that there's a, there's a huge difference between light and dark. And you know, the longer we live in Christ, the, not the longer we live in Christ, but the more we mature in our life in Christ, the more we get to know Christ, the more we imitate and follow Christ, the more contrast we see in the light and the dark. See, if we're not really seeking to imitate Christ, it can be fuzzy. fuzzy. It can be blurry, right? right? What's right and what's wrong, what's light and dark can, can be very blurry. We kind of get into that. We talked about last week, that mindset of like, well, you know, I'm a pretty good person. We, we kind of think of goodness as being, as being in the light. This idea of just kind of a semi-moral person is light. But the more we walk in Christ, the more we see, no, anything off the mark is out of the light. And God calls us to constantly seek the light, to seek what discerns the Lord. And the more time we spend with God, the more we learn not just what he wants, but we desire to live out what he wants. Which leads us to our third point. We're called to imitate Christ, we're called to represent Christ, but we're also called to live for Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. Look at what it says in verse 15. 15 and following. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Make the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk for, uh, with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Actually, we're going to talk about verse 21, submitting to one another next week. But look at what he says there. Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, as not, but as wise. Make the most use of your time here on this earth because the days are evil. <coughs> Sorry. But what Paul's saying here is live for Christ. Another way to say this is to make the most of this life, right? Make the best of it. You know, a lot of times when people say something like that, that, like make the most of this life, they're usually talking about like, hey, go party it up, right? You only live once, so, so get out there and, and get everything you can. You know, live with no consequences. But really to make the most of every opportunity, to make the most of this life, life is to follow Christ, to live for God's purposes, 
The more we live for God's purposes, the greater fulfillment, joy, and peace we will find in this life. In fact, I would even say that another thing that we will find, the greater we will find adventure. You want the best life? You want the most exciting, adventurous, joy-filled, fulfilling life? It's to follow Christ. It's to live for him. Because, you know, the more you live for him, what does Paul say here? The more you will begin to understand what the Lord's will is. And the more you grow in him and the more you understand his will, the more life will open up for you and experience the abundant life that Christ has for you. See, the more mature I've become in my faith, the less I've found myself worried about the details of right and wrong. And the more I have found myself concerned with making the most of every opportunity that God gives me. To make the most of every opportunity that God gives me to imitate him, to impact others for Christ, to make a difference in people's lives, to walk in his footsteps and treat people as he would have me treat them. I think far less about what's right and wrong and more about whether or not my life is an imitation of Christ. See, and in a way, Paul is saying here, look, to to live in such a way that your life represents Christ, and by the more you represent Christ, the more life will open up to you. You will no longer live as unwise, but you will be wise. You will make the best use of the time that you have here on this earth. See, unfortunately, very few people take little time to think about where they want their life to go. Very few people think about where they really want to be in five years from now, 10 years from now, or 20 years from now. Instead, for the most part, most people think about the choices in front of them, and they make the choice based on what's going to bring them what they want right now. Right? That's why we live in so much debt. That's why we are always looking for quick fixes to our health, because we're not willing to make the choices it takes to get where we want to be. We spend very little time thinking about what we really want our legacy to be. We spend very little time thinking about what kind of imprint and what kind of impact we want to make on people. (coughs) What kind of results we want in the relationships that we have. If you want to look carefully how you walk, you have to look further out. You can't just look at this ve- the very next step. You know, I ride a motorcycle. When you ride a motorci- motorcycle, one of the things you learn is you can't just look right out in front of you. You have to look where you want to go. You're constantly looking where you want to go. And you know what? When you're looking where you want to go, you still see the obstacles in front of you. You still see the things in your way, but you're actually avoiding them because you're always looking at where, the, where you end up wanting to be, not at the thing in front of you. And the same thing is so true in life. When we think this short-term way, we end up finding more problems in life. But when we think about where we want to be, when we make choices with our time that help us take steps in the direction we want to be, we'll do the work to get us there. If you want to imitate Christ, you have to think past the decision right in front of you. You have to think past how these decisions will get you where you want to be for the long haul. You have to make the most of the life that you have. And so I ask you this, what are you doing to align your life with Jesus? What are you doing to take steps to know how to imitate to be able to live the best life possible here on this earth. Each and every one of us are called to imitate Christ. And in order to do so, we need to know him personally. I started off by asking you, if you were on trial for being a Christ follower, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If you were on trial today, Would you be able to give testimony? Would your friends, your family, your coworkers, your neighbors, would they be able to give testimony that they see you seeking to have the attitudes of Christ in your heart? Would they see that 
you don't make decisions on what's best going to serve you right now, but you make decisions based on who you believe God is calling you to be. Let's pray. God, I just thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity for us to grow in you, to know you better. God, help us to have a heart the desires to imitate you, to walk in your footsteps, not just not in our actions as much as in our hearts, in the attitudes of our hearts, knowing that the more we seek to walk in you in the attitude of our hearts, our actions will follow because we won't have to try. We won't have to make ourselves make those choices. We will desire those choices because we desire to be more like you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Just as a reminder, we are going to be celebrating communion next weekend, so make sure that you have all the elements needed to do so. Also, I want to remind you, if you haven't had a chance to do so, please download the Church Center app so you can stay up to date on all the different things that are happening with the church and, and see how you can be involved. Thanks again, and have a great week.